going to continue our discussion of the Federal Tort Claims Act. We're going to add in the Flood Control Act of 1928, which introduces a different kind of immunity. And we're going to look at this all in the context of cases that arose after Hurricane Betsy flood New Orleans in 1965. Litigation after Hurricane Betsy focused on whether the Mississippi River Gulf outlet increased the flooding on the east side of New Orleans. The Mississippi River Gulf outlet, usually called the Mr. Go, is a canal from the Mississippi River shortcutting directly out to the Gulf of Mexico. This comes off the north side of the river on the north part of New Orleans then cuts southeast into the Gulf of Mexico. This was intended to be a shortcut for shipping, which would save both time and the hazards of going down the very long route on the, through the lower Mississippi. Uh, it was also hoped that this could be dredged to a deeper level than the lower Mississippi, which would allow larger ships to come into New Orleans. The Mr. Go was lobbied for since the early 1900s and the Corps of Engineers of, was given authorization to build it in the early 1950s. The original plan showed it connected to the Mississippi River with a full-size shipping lock that would allow large ships and large strings of barges to go through the Mississippi River into the Mr. Go and out into the Gulf of Mexico. The final for the Mr. Go show a very different situation where it connects to the Mississippi River there's a very small lock. This is an overhead view of the lock. You can see from the scale of the residential neighborhoods around it, the trees around it, that this would not be large enough for even a long string of barges much less any major ocean going shipping. So effectively the ultimate construction of Mr. Go prevented it from being used for any significant shipping. This had long-term implications because as shipping containerized, which happened after the Mr. Go was completed, then ever larger container ships started moving between the United States and Europe and Asia. There was also the problem that the largest ships that can go through the Panama Canal, which is one of the major constraints, certainly couldn't go through this lock. So the Mississippi, Lower Mississippi, remains a primary channel for shipping, and that has prevented the Port of New Orleans from becoming a major uh, cargo port because they can't bring very large container ships into the city or other very large seagoing ships. The other question about Mr. Go is whether it can funnel water into the city during a hurricane. When we look at the satellite map of New Orleans, and we can see Mr. Go as, this, as, the, as it cuts out to the Gulf, the red marker uh, is pointing to the center of Mr. Go. This is the current Mr. Go, which has been widened through erosion. But when you look at it on this map, you can see how small it is in comparison to the whole east side of the city. When the hurricane surged from Betsy and then Katrina came in on the east side of the city, all of those areas that show on the map is effectively underwater, uh, some of them are underwater, some are low marsh, provide no resistance to the storm surge and it rolls in on a 20 mile wide front, uh, nearly 20 feet deep in the case of Katrina, which tells us that the very small additional volume of Mr. Go can't have any significant effect on the amount of water coming into the city. After the design of the Mr. Go was changed so that it did not have a major shipping lock, it was rethought of as a way to have a ship channel with industry on it, uh, which would be analogous to the Houston ship channel. However, unlike the Houston ship channel, which at the time it was built, 
uh, was widening a bio that went through relatively high land. The Mr. Go was cut through low marshland, which was effectively pudding, uh, and it's impossible to build any sort of major structures on that area. So ultimately, when Mr. Go is finished and the shipping started on it, the small boats in 1963, technically the last of the construction wasn't done until 68, but it was effectively finished by the time of Hurricane Betsy. It really only provided some limited access to the Gulf for, sh for shrimp boats and other small vessels. Hurricane Betsy hit New Orleans in 1965. One of the key things with Betsy is that, as the court notes, it's not the first hurricane to flood New Orleans. Uh, the records show that New Orleans has been flooded on a regular basis by hurricanes since the earliest settlers. Interestingly, the hurricane before Hurricane Betsy hit New Orleans, there had been a major hurricane scare in the year or two previously, and the city had prepared good evacuation and disaster response plans. Betsy killed relatively few people while flooding New Orleans almost as completely as Hurricane Katrina did. After all hurricane, major hurricane flooding events, there's a search for someone to blame. Uh, in this case, the Corps of Engineers and the Mr. Go were targeted. When Mr. Go was constructed, there were no flood control levees between Mr. Go and the city. So that's a major change we'll talk about when we finally talk about the Katrina litigation. But in this case, the Corps just went into the existing area, built Mr. Go, did not build any additional levees. And the argument was that Mr. Go had funneled water into the city, making the flooding worse. The same rationale was brought up in the Katrina litigation. As we could have seen, see with our own eyes with the map, the tiny cross-sectional volume of Mr. Go doesn't really provide any channel for very much additional water to come in on a hurricane front. At the time of the Hurricane Betsy, there were careful scientific studies done of the potential transport capacity of Mr. Go, and it was found to be only a tiny fraction of the surge front. These same studies were repeated after Hurricane Katrina with the same results. The Hurricane Betsy litigation involved the Federal Tort Claims Act, but also the Flood Control Act of 1928. This was passed after the catastrophic Mississippi River flood in 1927. The major purpose of the Flood Control Act of 1928 was to lay out a new plan for levees and floodway easements on the rest of the Mississippi Basin that had not been previously controlled by the Corps of Engineers to provide funding for this project and to lay out some constraints on liability. Now, it's critical to remember that in 1927, the Federal Tort Claims Act had not been passed, and so the government still enjoyed broad sovereign immunity for anything that looked like a tort suit. And on the other hand, since the taking liability was in the Bill of Rights and thus amended the Appropriations Clause, the statutes could not get away with get a, do away with liability for the takings. So there's been some question about the purpose of putting in an immunity provision, but it's arguable that this might have affected other statutory waivers of immunity that had been passed as part of the Court of Federal Claims legislation. The immunity is broad. No liability of any kind shall attach to or rest upon the United States for any damage from or by floods or floodwaters at any place. So it's hard to come up with a more specific 
waiver of immunity to deal with damage from floods. There were additional provisions in this, in the Flood Control Act of 28, empowering the government to buy property or to buy floodway easements as was necessary as part of the flood control projects. Various claims against the Corps of Engineers for construction of Mr. Go after Hurricane Betsy were consolidated in the Gracie versus United States series of cases. These went up to the Fifth Circuit on the question of whether the Flood Control Act immunity would prevent the cases entirely, and if they could survive Flood Control Act immunity, uh, how they should be resolved under the Federal Tort Claims Act. Prior to the Federal Tort Claims Act passage in 1945, most of the claims brought uh, with flooding-related issues were takings claims, which should, could survive Flood Control Act immunity. After the Federal Tort Claims Act was passed, the courts had to look harder into whether the Federal Tort Claims Act actually repealed the Section 702 immunity of the Flood Control Act. The courts found that it didn't repeal that immunity, and thus any claim that involved potential flooding would have to be analyzed under the Flood Control Act before it was analyzed under the Federal Tort Claims Act. That raised the question about whether Flood Control Act immunity applied to projects other than flood control projects, such as navigation projects and irrigation projects. The Fifth Circuit was not the first court to look at this, and at looking back at other precedent, the court first reminded us that 702C, the immunity provision of the Flood Control Act, was aimed at flooding occurring in areas involved in actual or potential flood control projects. That's not in the language of 702, but they're reading that as part of the context of the overall Flood Control Act of 1928. So one of the early questions in the construction of 702 is whether it actually means what it says, which is any damages from floodwaters anywhere, or whether it's constrained by the context of the larger Flood Control Act to only apply to flood control projects. The Fifth Circuit decided that it was limited to flood control projects, and since there were no, no levees built with the Mr. Go, it was a pure navigation project, and thus would not be covered by 702 immunity. It's remanded back to the district court for the Federal Tort Claims Act analysis. Now we'll see later on as the Supreme Court finally looks at the Flood Control Act immunity that they read it much more broadly than this. So on appeal, the, federal, the district court did fact-finding to see whether the plaintiff's claims fit within the Federal Tort Claims Act. The first finding of the court was that Hurricane Betsy flooded New Orleans, but it didn't flood it in areas that hadn't been flooded before. Um, that since 1900, there were 88 hurricanes and tropical storms that went through or by the Louisiana coast. Three of these had caused significant flooding uh, on the east side of New Orleans, it's much the same as for Hurricane Betsy. The court also found that while the damage from Betsy was more severe than the prior hurricanes, that was really attributable to the the track of Betsy. It hit with a maximum force uh, coming into the city and that it was quite a large storm. So the court found that while Betsy did cause more flooding, it caused it uniformly across the Louisiana coast. There was no indication that there was any increased flooding in the area uh, of the Mr. Go Canal. They even pointed out that after Betsy, the Corps of Engineers and NOAA recalculated some of their notions of hurricane protection. The court found that uh, Mr. Go did not increase the flooding, that all the flooding was just the normal process of a large hurricane 
moving into a very low coastal area with a large surge front flooding everything in its wake. There were four key negligence fact findings in Gracie. These are important because they influenced how the plaintiffs ultimately brought the Katrina case. The first was that they couldn't find any difference between the project as completed and the construction of the project as directed by Congress, that the plaintiffs failed to show by a preponderance of the evidence any fault by the defendant in the design, construction, or functioning of the Mr. Go that the plaintiffs couldn't find that there was any problems with the design or functioning of the project, nor was there any causal connection between the Mr. Go and any damages with plaintiffs might have sustained, i.e. that causation failed. The problem with these findings, while they are correct, is that these are classic private party negligence findings. These are the sort of questions you'd ask under Louisiana tort law, which is the tort law to apply, but against a private party. So there was no discussion of the discretionary function immunity. There was no discussion of the differing duty for the Corps of Engineers versus a private party. There were a lot of questions raised by this, uh, these fact findings about decisions the Corps made about the design, which this court found were non-negligent but more fundamentally they would not subject the court to, to liability under discretionary function exemption even if they had been negligent. So one of the questions was whether these this private tort law analysis ultimately led the attorneys in the Katrina cases to state their case incorrectly. It's not until 2001 that the U.S. Supreme Court finally clarifies the meaning of Section 702C of the Flood Control Act. This involved the California Water Project, which is a massive irrigation project to take water from the mountains, from the winter snow, take it into the valley for irrigation purposes and to fill reservoirs with the water to try to spread out the irrigation water during the dry part of the year. The damages in this case were from a leaking irrigation canal. The excess water drowned the roots of trees in a commercial orchard. The trees died and the orchard owner is suing for damages. The government's response is that Flood Control Act immunity, 702 immunity, should apply and that the case should be dismissed. This raises the question about whether there was any flood control purpose and whether that mattered in determining the applicability of the act. If we remember under the old Fifth Circuit interpretation from 1971, the act only applied to flood control projects. Well, in this case, we have an irrigation system, but one that has flood control purpose at least for part of the year. When the big winter snowfalls melt, the, these canals channel the water into reservoirs and control the runoff, so they do have some flood control purpose at part of the year. The government argues any flood control purpose, 702 immunity for everything all of the time. The holding in Central Green goes back to the actual language of 702. Immunity attaches to any damage from or by flood or flood waters. The court breaks from the previous interpretation of the Fifth Circuit and a few other uh, circuits by determining the character of the immunity on the water, not the project. So the court is telling us this has nothing to do with whether it's a flood control project or a navigation project or an irrigation project. The question is, is the damage caused by floodwaters? So if we look at the language again, no liability of any kind shall attach to or rest upon the United States for any damage from or by floods or floodwaters at any place. 
So if we look at this project, if this is a water project, like an irrigation system that also has a flood control purpose, then the flood control purpose isn't why the 702 immunity applies. It only applies if the damage is caused by flood water. If you've got a pure navigation project, which under the old reading would not have Flood Control Act immunity, but the damage was caused by a massive flood, um, say something like Hurricane Harvey or the 2016 flood in Baton Rouge, then under this plain language, that's flood water, and it shouldn't matter whether it was a navigation project. Now, the converse of that is if it is a flood control project, which the old reading of the Fifth Circuit would say triggers Flood Control Act immunity, but what if the, dam what if the damages are not caused by floodwaters? Let's say that the levee construction causes some unrelated damage. The weight of the levee, uh, is caught, which increases the sinking of the ground, breaks some sewer lines and leaking sewage causes the damages. Under this flood water analysis, even though it's a flood control structure, there's a strong argument that the Flood Control Act immunity would not apply. So when we read Central Green, it looks like the 1971 reading of 702 immunity by the Fifth Circuit is now out of date. It should be moved to flood waters, not flood control structures.